Hello, salam. Welcome back to another episode of the African Fiveside Podcast. I'm your host, Maher Mizahi, and uh, we are officially, officially back from the African Cup of Nations. I know I said that last time, uh, but I was slacking a little bit. We are officially back to doing two podcasts per week uh, from now, really, up until summertime. Um, as you all know, match day one at the beginning of this podcast was a five episode series that we produced um, that looked at different heads of state in African football history and how they used football to advance their political uh, social agendas. We are going to be heading into match day two uh, in March and match day two as a theme is going to be iconic African football shirts. We've picked out five iconic shirts and these are going to be very well detailed um, episodes where we go speak to the people that design the shirts, see how they got their ideas for them. We're going to go over some of the classic football matches that were played in these shirts, um, and so on and so forth. And these are going to be very well-detailed episodes. They might also have some vlog elements, um, you know, incorporated. I might, you know, show you as I go and interview these people um, one-on-one -on -one and see what their inspiration was. So I think you're really going to enjoy these. Um, you can expect an introductory episode for match day two about classic african football shirts uh probably in the middle of march they are going to take a little bit longer to produce so it's not going to be every week but uh, they will be coming uh, consistently down the pipe but until then like i said we're going to be doing two episodes per week mainly about current footballing affairs and so over the last 10 days uh the main thing that's been happening in african football we have the champions league and the confederation cup and i'm going to give you my thoughts on those after the sixth and final match day of the group stages, um, which is going to be this upcoming weekend. So that's going to be the next episode. Uh, but today, today, what I wanted to talk about um, is the 2024 Summer Olympic Game women's football qualifiers, because um, we are right smack dab in the middle of them. Uh, you have Nigeria, who are uh, who have advanced and now are only two matches away from Paris 2024. We have South Africa, who are taking on Tanzania. Uh, they won 3-0 in the first leg. And Banyana are now going to be uh, playing the second leg, I believe, at home. So they really have a big advantage to the African champions. And they're going to be uh, playing against, excuse me, they're going to be playing against uh, yeah Tanzania in the second leg, and then they're going to be taking on Nigeria. So that's oh, a heavyweight battle. And Africa only has two places at the Summer Olympic Games, which is probably too few, right? Um, on the other side of the bracket, we have Morocco going up against uh, Tunisia, and Morocco won 1-0 away from home. And so the finalists of the last WAFCON, uh, they do have a pretty hefty advantage going back to Morocco, and I expect them to make it through um, to the final tie where they will probably be facing Zambia, the Copper Queens, the Shipolo Polo, uh, in my opinion, the best um, women's national team nickname in Africa. Um, they're... They're going up against the uh, Black Queens instead of the Black Stars uh, of Ghana, um, who have do have a lot of talent players like Evelyn Badu, um, but they lost one nil at home, and I can't really see them overturning that deficit over in Zambia. So why are we talking about these qualifiers? Well, obviously, they're very, very important, and um, they mean so much. But before we talk about you know all of these teams, what I really wanted to speak about was there were 29 teams that did not even enter qualifying for the Paris 2024 games for, for the women's national teams. Some of these 29 teams include Algeria, Egypt, Côte d'Ivoire, Angola, Libya, Cape Verde, and many, many more. Um, if there was a good reason for not entering these teams, maybe we could have a debate. But for a country like Algeria, for example, which, I mean, for the longest period of time, I mean, Al Algeria doesn't lack funds. The federation doesn't lack funds. Uh, the federation is known to be at least minimally competent. But the previous federation uh, administration and the previous federation president, Jahid Zvisif, and, and his entire federal bureau literally forgot to enter the team into qualifying. Uh, it's a mistake of epic proportions. Um, 
Senegal, we didn't, we weren't given like there was no statement issued by the FSF or the the Senegalese Federation. People are just assuming it's another administrative error as well. And these are we're talking about the 2019 Afcon champions, 2021 Afcon champions, two of the biggest names on the continent. And honestly, not bad women's teams too. Uh, Algeria have qualified, I believe, to five Afcons in the past, and uh, do have a lot of really great talent coming through. Cote d'Ivoire. This one is crazy because Cote d'Ivoire, we did get a reason why they d were not entered into these qualifiers. And they're financial. Uh, the federation came out and said, unfortunately, uh, we do not have the funds. This was actually prior to the AFCON. We do not have the funds to put the women's national team through the eight matches of qualifying necessary to make it to Paris 2024. Uh, I mean, that's absolutely mind-blowing when considering that as a country, Cote d'Ivoire spent over a billion dollars, a billion dollars on their AFCON. I mean, that includes infrastructure, that includes, you know, all kinds of things. But that much money, we can't find, you know, a few tens of thousands to perhaps give Cote d'Ivoire, who again have a decent team, uh, the at least the opportunity to compete to try and make it to the Olympic Games next summer. Uh, but yeah, even like some of the other names I mentioned, you know, Angola, Lib well, Libya is, I guess, in civil war and the federation's all messed up. But even like Cape Verde, we were so impressed with the men's team. Why not give the women a chance? Um, just looking over a few of these other names. Yeah, Mauritania. Mauritania is a federation that I've been, you know, big ups to for a long period of time. And you know, we've been talking about them as having very good governance. And part of them having good governance was they actually created a women's national team over the last decade. But they didn't uh, enter them into qualifying this time around. Anyways, um, how do I see this going? I, I'm, I'm not, I don't pretend to be an African women's football expert, not at all. Um, but I think by consensus, Nigeria is the best team right on the continent. There is one every single WAFCON but three. Two were won by Equatorial Guinea and one by South Africa. Uh, they're the best team on paper. They have the best players on paper. And them getting past Cameroon was a big one. That was a big derby. Against South Africa, I think it's a toss-up because South Africa are so organized and their players are now you know, playing in places like Mexico, Tembi Catalana, so good. Um, they, they now have the individual quality that they maybe lacked when they were going up against Nigeria in years past. Um, so I think Banyana could give the Super Falcons a run, a run for their money. Zambia versus Morocco is one that's much more of an unknown. I think the two strongest sides in Africa are Nigeria and South Africa. Um, Zambia and Morocco are strong sides, but I think if you know things were mixed up and Morocco had to play against either of Nigeria or South Africa, or even Zambia had to play against either, either of Nigeria or South Africa, we would have Nigeria and South Africa going to Paris. But because the bracket is the way that it is, M Zambia versus Morocco is going to be an interesting one. I think Morocco have a lot of talent from the diaspora, and this is something that you know, North African nations have been doing a very good job of. They did it with men's football for a very long period of time where they were going to get players um, born and raised in France and using them to prop up the national team because, you know, the domestic football was perhaps a little bit weaker. So think about players like, you know, Riyad Mahrez, Sofiane Farouli, Islam Slimani. Uh, these are Algerian, but even Morocco. Think about Hakim Ziyech, Ashraf Hakimi, you know. Uh, the North African nations, because of their proximity to Europe, they have huge diasporas. And as a result, sometimes it's, it's not necessarily a good thing for the national teams because the success of the national teams can be used to patch up holes. Um, and, you know, um, the best thing would be for the domestic league to be strong and to have a robust domestic league with many, many different clubs um, and to not have the sort of sociological issues that, um, you know, uh, some of the, the North African nations do, where sometimes it can be taboo for girls to play football, where that isn't the case in Europe. Um, however, uh, these issues do exist, and I think the federations are doing a good job of recruiting from the diaspora. So Morocco has stepped that up in a major way over the last five years, and so has Algeria. Uh, I don't know why I'm talking about Algeria. They're not really relevant. But that, that explains, in my opinion, Morocco's progress, as well as the fact that they hosted the last WAFCON. I think the fact that they hosted and they got the, the crowds that they did, I think those things artificially boosted 
the results for the Moroccan uh, Atlas lionesses. As for Zambia, I think they have a little bit more quality, especially when it comes to you know individual talent. Barbara Banda is a top five player on the continent, probably top three player on the continent. And the fact that they also have now um, the most expensive women's player in, in the world, uh, Rachel Kundananji, um, who everybody's been talking about. I believe she cost $800,000. Um, and she's the one that scored the goal in the first leg against Ghana with a beautiful chip. I urge everyone to go check that goal out. Um, Zambia, look, in my opinion, they have a little bit more quality. So I think they would probably get past Morocco unless Morocco can sort of drum up that atmosphere that they had at the WAFCON and get you know tens of thousands to the stadium again um, and use that to their advantage. But if not, I think we're going to have either Zambia as one of the Paris 2024 teams and then on the other side, either uh, Nigeria or South Africa. I don't really feel comfortable making a prediction uh, for either. It could be really, really close. So. Yeah, um, I just wanted to, to quickly touch on these Olympic qualifiers because 29 teams not entering qualifying is a big shame. Um, we talk about investing in football, all football, at all ages, in all categories. And for some of these federations to simply not care enough to enter their teams is shocking. And for the ones that did care, but they couldn't come up with the funds I don't, I don't buy it because I think if you go to FIFA on time and you're organized with your finances and you ask them for the funds, they'll give you the funds. That could be one of your FIFA forward um, applications, for example. Um, so that's absolutely inexcusable. Uh, the African continent needs to do better at the top end and at the bottom end. Because there are teams, you know, like, like Niger, like Mali, like, um, not Mali, but let's say Niger, or let's say, um, let's say Somalia, where you know women's football is almost inexistent and we really have a long way to go but even at the top end we were forgetting to enter teams into qualifying so i just wanted to to you know rant about that a little bit say that we need to do better and maybe give you guys you know a little bit of a preview of these matches that are coming up to see which two women's national teams will be representing the african continent at paris 2024. So yeah, this weekend we're going to be talking CAF Men's Champions League and the Confederation Cup, uh, going over the group stages in general, who were the standout performers, um, going over the knockout stages and, and seeing uh, maybe who can be uh, favorites this year to win the competition. Thanks for tuning in. This was a little bit of a shoulder, shorter episode, but um, just to get back into the flow of things and to... Uh, yeah, get back into the flow of things and, and to say hi and, and to get back into a regular, consistent output. Thanks for tuning in. We'll speak to you soon and peace.